Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Hopefully well, right? You ready for some more world civilization? Okay, I sure hope so. Um, it should be fun. We're going to get into agrarian, the uh, earliest knowledge of agrarian, which is a farming uh, societies uh, and the main one. So people started out, you know, you talk about the classic when you see cartoons and old movies and what have you, you talk about um, cavemen, right? Cave people, cave women. And they basically had to go out and hunt every day and try to kill uh, some kind of animal. And so later, the next step, when they started looking for, uh, you know, fertile land as you say and as we learned last week in just a little bit of the beginning usually by rivers and water that helped them sustain uh some type of even small crops then they started staying longer uh in places because they were on to the next level the agrarian being able to grow their own food and say you know i don't have to go out today and uh, go kill uh, a woolly mammoth with uh, my 10 other friends you know so uh, that's what we're really going to get into today. All right. So everybody come along for the ride. All right. So let me go through the procedure. Go to the material. Make sure we're starting on the correct page. All right. Hit the slideshow. Go well, from the beginning, here we go, world civilizations. Let me minimize myself again, that has to be minimized. This is a uh, learning class, not a modeling class, right? Which I wouldn't be hired from my modeling anyway. So that's minimized, okay? So here we go. Week two, folks, week two. So if you, need the date it should be um let me see here give me the exact date my calendar's a little backwards sorry all right it's going to be monday the 12th okay monday the 12th since last week was the fifth our first week okay they get into the juicy agrarian material so the population increase, well, here's the title, Mesopotamia. So we'll learn about what is the meaning of Mesopotamia. It says the population increased due to the agricultural revolution. Again, uh, people for the most part start, stopped being hunters and gatherers because they were able to grow things and uh, be able to stay put in an area longer. Um, so this agricultural revolution led to the creation of farming villages. There you go. Often in the same locations where nomadic, nomadic means people who wander from here to there. They live someplace for a short time, drop their house and go live someplace else. So these nomadic hunter gatherers had previously settled temporarily to plant their crops and graze their livestock. So graze means uh, whatever livestock you had. And I explained this last week. Uh, you could have uh, uh, cows, or sheep. They have to eat too. So they usually eat grass. And you get into an area where you can farm a little bit, there's grass. So they have to let them eat. And then it says here grains, you know, were the usual basis of early agriculture because they're easiest to grow. And the residents of those areas with fertile, which means good soil, soil that uh, you know will let you have a nice harvest or whatever you're growing. Uh, so for example, probably desert soil, it's not good for, hey, I planted these tomatoes. You really don't see that in the desert. And you had sufficient rain. Again, in the desert, you don't have sufficient rain. Heck, even Los Angeles, here we don't have sufficient rain. 
in a temperate climate, which means a pretty even climate and good, not too cold, to support wild grains were the pioneers of village development. Again, we're talking about the very first uh, villages. Again, if you're out there hunting and gathering, maybe, you know, you and your buddies have killed the last wild deer in your area. So you got to move and go where they're, you know, they're plentiful. So, but if you start developing a farming culture, um, you can eat what you farm and then the deers will probably come back. So from the farming village slowly evolved the much more socially differentiated town with its various economic divisions and occupational specialties. So what they're trying to say here is once you start settling down from farmers and then make a village, uh, human beings start you know, developing these different social structures, you know, who's in charge of this, who's in charge of that, where again, when you start off at the old caveman level, that really doesn't exist. You're out there trying to survive every day. Uh, once you get established and people start somehow uh, picking areas where they might have a little power or influence, okay. So from some settlements grew the larger cities or centers called cities. See, here we go. The larger you get, now you're getting governmental power. Religious ritual, which is the routine. Manufacturing. Trade and cultural sophistication. A combination of agrarianism, city life, Social complexity, again, who's on the higher end, who's in the middle, who's in the lower. Government, trade networks, and writing produce the earliest known civilizations in history, in the world history, like the name of our class. One of these was Sumeria in Southern Mesopotamia, like I have up here. Okay, well, that's dropping down and covering it, bad, bad computer, okay. So it says Neolithic Southwest Asia. So that's an area to be familiar with. Around 1500 BCE, the world's climate began warming after centuries of ice age conditions, like the old cartoon Ice Age, right? And a lot of animals were lost, frozen in time. Uh, melting glaciers in the Northern Hemisphere, raising sea levels, and covering the planet's land masses with vast, or very wide, inland lakes, streams, and forests. In Southwestern Asia, giant stands of oak and pistachio forests. I bet you didn't know pistachio trees grow that big. And the bounteous herds, which means many, many of game. Again, it, you know, like if you lived in Alaska, you'd, you would have the game would be a caribou, you know, replaced ice age grasslands. Hunter-gatherers of the Near and Middle East called Natufians stocked antelope. Now, before I head on to the next page, I have, you know, this means question time. You know how that goes. So, and let me read some of this side material, which we talked about last week. Okay, uh, just a little time frame. I'm not gonna ask you any questions from this, so don't, don't get worried, right? Uh, if you haven't taken a type of history class with me before, uh, even American students, they, they hate having to learn all kinds of different dates. So I, I, for the most part, I try to stay away from a lot of different dates because I find them confusing. I rather really have the students learn some type of content that they can always remember. It's easy to remember and they can always refer to instead of like, you know, 
you get like, let's say American history, 1776, uh, the war of 1812, 1914, what happened 1941, December 7th? It's like, I try to stay away from a lot of those. So here we go, 15,000 to 10,000 BC, end of the last ice age. So the last time that majority of the earth was covered in ice. 10,000 BCE, first evidence of agriculture in the Levantine quarter. The next, uh, the following readings, we're gonna learn about the Levantine corridor, okay? Uh, and that's the first sign of, oh, what kind of society is this? You know, old day agriculture. 5,000 BCE, Sumerians arrive in Mesopotamia. And that's who we're going to concentrate our focus on, They're the most famous folks. Uh, 3,500 BCE, cuneiform writing. So the first evidence of some kind of writing, you know, but not on books or in books or on paper, stones. Uh, clay stones. Uh, 3000 BC, Sumerian city states develop. So look at that, like 500 years later, you get a city state. Uh, 2300 BC, Sargon of Akkad. So you might have heard that in the, what is it, the Hobbit movies? Sargon. Uh, 1700s BC, Hammurabi, the oldest surviving law code. So that's the first code. So if you're, you know, if you're a Christian, then you know about Moses' Ten Commandments. So this is uh, from another uh, group of folks. 1500 BC, the Hittites conquer Mesopotamia. Oh, that's not good. Here we're learning about these good folks, and then later some, something bad happens to them. Uh, 900 BC, rise of Assyria, another major powerful civilization of its time. And then 539 BC, conquest by Persia. And if you don't know, uh, Persia still exists. It's called Iran, right? Okay, so let me get my paper here and jump over to these questions I have on uh, 17, if you're following. So if I have Wani, which I think I do, she loves to know the pages we're on. So this is 17, if you purchase the book. Okay. So let's go to the whiteboard. Okay, do I already have that pencil? Wow, I'm, I'm doing magic now. No, I don't have it. See, get that pencil. It looked like it. Okay, question one. Try to stretch it out. Okay, that's enough. Uh, the agricultural revolution led to the creation of what? So again, when you have this first agricultural establishments being made in history, it led to something else. Something else was created from that that didn't prior exist before. Okay, question two. And let me stretch this out. Mm, that looks pretty good. Got two lines there. Okay, which combination of things, so it's not just one thing or two things, uh, produced the earliest civilization in world history. So uh, what I want here are the events or situations that came together and then 
that's what um, produced the earliest civilizations that came out of these things. So let me give you a few to uh, answer these two. Okay. Pretty self-explanatory. Wasn't a long page, so it shouldn't be difficult for you. No. At least if uh, you're a slow pokey, um, at least write them down. You can always answer them later. You have a, a week's time to submit it, so. No rush, life is busy. I know how things get. Okay, so that should be enough time so I can move on. I will repeat these. Okay, the agricultural revolution led to the creation of what? What came about it? Uh, Burger King, an in and out burger? I don't think so. Okay, let me grab that eraser so this one's gone. Shoot. Two, repeating which combination of things produced the earliest civilization in the world. So don't say my funny guys, you know, oh, a casino and then a Disneyland and then a Santa Monica up here. No. Okay. Right about the beginnings of time here. All right. Let's go back to the material. So um, this is. Uh, where we ended off, we introduced the Natufians and they stalked antelope, which means you follow them very closely before you hunt them. Okay, that's uh, stalking, even though we have the present term where uh, some guy's in love with some girl and she doesn't pay attention to him and then he still follows her around. So they call that stalking, but this is where it came from. So let's move on. So again, they stock antelope and Persian, which again is in Iran, gazelle, which is usually we see gazelles in uh, Africa. So it's like a kind of like a large deer, but the horns go straight up in the air They're very fast. And they harvested wild nuts and grasses using flint bladed sickles. Sickles are a curved knife or blade. And they're really good for cutting long grasses and weeds. So, and enabled them to expand their populations dramatically, right? Because now if you have a large area with a lot of uh, farming, people wanna stay there. They don't wanna go <sighs> be like before and live with a group of 10 people in a cave and then go have to hunt. There's an established farm in a community. It's safer. Food is easy to eat more easier accessible. So that's why populations expanded dramatically. However, around 1100 BCE, a catastrophe occurred. And a catastrophe is something really, something really, really bad that happened, like you know, a tornado that killed uh, a small town or an earthquake that uh, killed a, a village. You know, it's a catastrophe. Uh, known to archeologists as the Younger Dryas event, glacial melt water that had accumulated in a colossal, which means giant, freshwater lake in Northern Canada suddenly burst into the Atlantic Gulf Stream Triggering, which means starting a thousand year long regression or going backward in Europe and Southwestern Asia to the cooler and drier conditions of the late ice age, which is not good for farming. And as you'll see here, the abundant sources of water and plant foods previously available to humans and animals alike disappeared. Uh oh. Not good for food storage. 
forcing Natufians to congregate or live in small semi-permanent villages near surviving streams and rivers. And like I mentioned last week, you know, you get by a river or a lake inside of it has fish and then the land around it is good for uh, growing your harvest. You want to stay away from the drier areas. Coming after a time when populations had grown dramatically, these catastrophic, again, catastrophe, events forced small groups of these Western Asians to adopt or take more intensive ways of managing their food resources. That's why I mentioned the spat for food storage earlier. Basically, this encouraged them to switch from gathering and hunting to planting and domesticating cereals like barley and wheat, which grew in wild forms in their natural environment. That's something that you need. Thus, the world's first farming settlements appeared in a section of the Near East called the Levantine Corridor, or Levantine, depends. Maybe England is Levantine. An arc of land that was endowed or given with especially high water tables and included a much present day Turkey. So this is the Levantine border now. It consists of Turkey, Israel, Syria, and the Euphrates River Valley. Here by 8,000 BCE, cereal agriculture had become widespread and people had added to their food stocks by domesticating and breeding goats and sheep. Later still, cattle were introduced, possibly from Africa. So if you don't know the term domesticating, um, it means you first, your first situation is you have some kind of wild animal and it has not lived with humans before, all right? So it's wild and you know, wild animals will do about anything, okay? It's a dangerous uh, situation. But, you know, just like now in the present day, we have domesticated dogs and cats. So they're our pets. They live with us, they love us. They normally don't, you know, go on crazy attacks, right? Or try to run away. They basically stay at home, they like it there. So they had to domesticate goats and sheep for food, right? And uh, later cattle were introduced. It's funny, you know, <laughs> you talk to some people, they say, what was the last domesticated animal in, uh, you know, humankind? And realize some things cannot be domesticated, like a great white shark, those things, that's why you don't see them in like a marine land or something. They cannot be domesticated. They will always kill a human if it gets in the wire with them, if they have an opportunity, right? But again, back to my joke, you know, this American joke, what was the last animal to be domesticated in the human's history? The man domesticated by the wife, right? Once they get married, the wife domesticates them. So I don't know if it's the same thing in your country, but that's what people say here as a joke. So continuing the switch to agriculture and livestock, breeding produce provided an abundance that allowed people to grow their populations. Here we go with growing the populations again, little towns, villages, cities, and congregate or live in towns and cities for the first time in history. And wherever this transformation occurred or happened, uh, the world's earliest recorded civilizations also appeared. Uh, First of these was in a part of the Levantine Corridor that included the valleys of the Tigris and Euphrates River and a land that the ancient Greeks called Mesopotamia, land between the rivers. Should I have something like that? I don't know. That might be too easy of a point on the midterm. I don't know. We'll see how I feel. Now the southern portion of Iraq. So there you go. Mesopotamia is the southern part of Iraq. If you want to know the exact... Um, location. 
Next up, uh, Sumerian civilization. Uh, along with early evidence of agriculture and herding, keeping animals together in one place. Some of the earliest towns and cities archaeologists have discovered are in southwestern Asia. Wow. The Euphrates and Tigris rivers originate in present-day Turkey and flow parallel to each other for about 400 miles before joining together to flow in the head of the Persian Gulf. In the third millennium BCE, the first urban civilization of the world, the first, get into it, developed in the lower courses of these rivers. This agrarian civilization was supported by extensive irrigation farming. So what that means is they were able to dig, let's say, I'll be really, really basic. So lines in the fertile soil and then put water in there and then you grow your crops. So this extensive irrigation, anything to do with free water flowing, pioneered by a people called the Sumerians. Uh, so you see here Sumerians who came into lower uh, Mesopotamia from somewhere to the east about 5000 BCE, gradually the Sumerians created a series of small competing, here we go, kingdoms now or city states. Here they developed a series of ideas and techniques that would provide the foundation of a distinct and highly influential civilization. So you see step by step, these things build up to something bigger and stronger always. The Sumerians were the first people to do a number of highly significant things. And I'll read the first one here, but we'll get into the rest. Uh, they created the first large cities and are distinct from towns and small cities like Sherika. So we look here to the left, we have a, our first photo this week. Uh, Jericho, located in the West Bank, Palestinian territory. The ruins of Jericho date back to about 8,000 BCE, making it one of the oldest Neolithic, remember that's the first week we, we got into the Neolithic term, cities in the world. This is a view of the round tower of the city, which the biblical prophet Joshua, if you read your Bible, is said to have toppled. Archaeologists it was said to have crumbled or fallen down. Archaeologists believe that an earthquake in the second millennium BCE actually destroyed the fortifications or the strong points of um, this tower. Okay, so um, this means I have to move on to my second set of questions. Okay, as I prepare everything step by step. Okay, so Got to go back to that whiteboard. Get that pencil. I don't think I have my usual. Like, this is I'm coming back. I was not working at IE uh, East IUE last quarter, so and I don't. I haven't seen any work turned in by Pervee or my usual, uh, you know, Temujin group of pencil stealers. So I don't know if they're around it's okay i miss you guys stealing my pencil so that's my feeling oh this is question three how about that Go, let me stretch this. Where did the world's first farming settlements appear? Where? Please don't say K-Town. Please don't say Las Vegas, you know, 
We're going back in history before those places uh, ever existed, right? On to question four. There's a double doozy right there at the end of this question. Let me stretch. Okay. Some of the earliest towns or cities slash, right, town slash cities, discovered by archaeologists. Here's the, here's the double doozy. Were where? Or where were? Or why so? Or were where? Again, give me locations. Don't give me K-Town. Don't give me Santa Barbara. Don't give me uh, New York City. All right. So let me give you a few to at least write those down. Oh, and for Wani, those are questions for uh, page 18. Okay. Hope you're doing well. Okay, that should be enough time. Let me go back for that eraser and repeat these questions so we thoroughly understand them. Where did the world's first farming settlements appear? So give me the location. Four, some of the earliest towns slash cities discovered by archaeologists were where? Again, location, as they say, in the restaurant business. Location, location, location. All right, let me head on back to the juicy reading material. Okay, check the time here. It's pretty good. Okay, checking the time. Am I doing well? Skip it on over. So this is where we ended. This is where we ended here on this picture. So again, um, the Sumerians created the first large cities and distinct from towns and small cities like Jericho. So proceeding, here's a nice new picture here, the fertile crescent. So see how it goes like this? Has a crescent, right? That's the blade, a crescent. If you were uh, familiar with the old Russian communist um, red flag and it had a yellow crescent blade, which they called a sickle, and then they had a golden hammer. So hammer was for building, represented building the society buildings. And then the crescent or gold sickle was to represent the, uh, you know, working in the wheat fields and feeding the people. And again, as you see these things, here's Jericho, Jerusalem, 
Palestine, Asia Minor up here. So, so here we go, the ancient Near East, the Mesopotamian city-states were concentrated in the rich agricultural plain, shown here in the green. Uh, uh, created by silt, which is like wet soil, from the Tigris and Euphrates rivers as they flow toward the head of the Persian Gulf. The white belt of land reaching from Mesopotamia to Egypt along the Mediterranean coast is known as the Fertile Crescent. Okay. So now we're continuing with the reading material. Um, these may have contained upward of 100,000 people. All early civilizations had advanced centers such as these, ones that drew their sustenance. Sustenance is the actual food that you eat to survive. From a surrounding countryside that they had subjected to their rule. So they were governing it. Each city was encircled for miles by villages of farmers who built the canals and provided the agricultural surplus on which the city elite or high society depended. Most of these city-states began as places of ritual prayer. That might be an important question. And sacrificial offerings, that means when you kill uh, an animal or a human being and offer it to the gods so that they will give you a good harvest or, uh, you know, good uh, weather, good fortune. And these sacrificial offerings that honored one or more of their gods, whose goodwill was purchased or bought so agriculture could flourish, like I just said. Gradually, the ceremonial aspects of the shrines and their priests were joined by commercial and governmental pursuits. So it became a place in which a growing population of labor, specialized people was supported by sophisticated, there's that word again, irrigation, flea flowing water, uh, agriculture. They developed the first sophisticated system of writing. So writing appeared at the time. They built the first monumental buildings, okay? Using sun-baked bricks and the post and lintel system, beams, which are long pieces of wood, held up by columns that supported them, used today in structures as varied as monkey bars and bridges as the basic elements of support. They probably invented the wheel as a load-bearing transportation device. Remember, the first two, it's generally agreed upon the first two discoveries that enabled man to come out of being like a caveman or almost like an animal was first was fire. Now he had fire to warm himself. No other animal on this planet has been able to make fire to warm themselves in a cold winter. And then the next one was to move things around easier than picking it up and walking back and forth 10 times, which was the wheel. And again, you don't see gorillas or dogs or cats. None of them have developed the wheel. Not that they couldn't use it if you taught them about how using it, but they have not come up with it on their own. Next, they were the first to design and build an irrigation system powered by the force of gravity. So water, uh, gravity forcing the water to uh, come down. So think of these irrigation systems uh, every time you say, wow, this is a toilet or this is a shower, right? That's where they came out of the irrigation systems. Last point here, at least on this page, they were the first to use the plow and among the first to make bronze, metal, utensils, and weaponry. So the plow, again, is a kind of like the, it's a, it's a big, big blade that looks something like an axe. 
and you're able to push it and push it through large grain fields. Remember, they were growing barley and wheat. Otherwise, you're going to have to do it by hand, chop, chop, pull, pull. You just push that plow and tang, 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 you can go right through it. And again, how much easier it is. Just think like now, if all you had was plastic utensils, knives, and forks to do things like making your food and cooking, how many times they would break. And before then, they had nothing. So imagine finally making bronze metal utensils that could really cut sharply and very hard to destroy. So this page has not been that long, but it will still contain at least one question. And Awani, this would be 19. Okay, so let me go back to the whiteboard, grab that pencil. So my one question in 19, it's a good one. Question six. Let me stretch. Okay. Uh, here is the question. Where did this early civilization draw its sustenance? So usually if I get a student that's not really paying attention. Um, they're like, what, what, which one? I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, it's this connected. We have two prior questions, uh, uh, four and five, right? And uh, if you remember, four, for example, some of the earliest towns and cities discovered by archaeologists were where, okay? So you find out where, then you know the city, right? Uh, and then you go to the which people pioneered agrarian civilization. Now you know the people. So it's connected to those two. So I mentioned this. I had to explain sustenance because it's a big word. So if you find sustenance, it, when you go back on the material, you'll find the answer. Okay. So let me give you a bit to finish that. Okay, that should be all the time we need to answer one question, right? All right, let me grab that eraser. Again, repeating, where did this early civilization draw its sustenance? Where did it find its food, basically? All right, let's uh, get back to the material. So we ended off on the weaponry. So we have to move. Okay, here we go, we're at the top of 20. What we know of the Sumerians is extremely impressive. That means that they were impressive. Not the knowledge that we have about them is impressive. We know a good deal, not only because they left extensive records, again, they were the first ones doing the writing, and physical evidence of their own, but also because they had enormous influence on their neighbors and rivals, such as the Akkadians and the world famous Egyptians. 
as well as on their several conquering successors in Mesopotamia. Remember, we just covered that on one of the sidebars there on the first page where Persia, you know, conquers them. They weren't the only ones. Uh, the early history of Mesopotamia under the Sumerians is a tale or story of great technological and cultural advances, marred or, you know, marked by strife, which is conflict, disunion, people not getting along. I don't like the United States right now. We have people really, really divided on the left and the right. And unceasing, which means it's not stopping, warfare among the principal city states. Trade wars and disputes over water assured that no centralized governing power was possible. Wow, so no centralized power that said, hey, Everybody's got to listen to me. I didn't want that. Whenever one city managed to seize or take control of substantial supplies of water and trade, the others upstream or downstream would band together against it or its subjects and would rebel or fight back. Conflict seemed to have been the order of the day with city-state vying or fighting against city-state in a constant struggle for mastery over precious irrigated lands. Again, irrigation, your shower, your toilet. Uh, not about, or not until about 2, 2300 BCE was the land between the rivers brought under one effective rule. Uh, and that was imposed by a Semitic invader known as Sargon, the great against Sargon for you Hobbit fans, who conquered the entire plain or the entire area. Sargon established his capital in the new town of Akkad, near modern day Baghdad, capital of Iraq. Although the Akkadian empire lasted less than a century, its influence was great for it spread Sumerian culture and methods far and wide in the Near and Middle East. Though, or sorry, through the wide belt of land reaching from Mesopotamia to Egypt, that is called the Fertile Crescent, which we went over in the map. Again, fertile, the ability to grow many, many things there because the land is rich, it's good. Uh, although the separate Sumerian city-states never united until outsiders overwhelmed them, their cultural and religious achievements and beliefs would be picked up by their conquerors and essentially retained by all their successors in Mesopotamia. So their culture and religious achievements, even though they were defeated by, again, like the Persians or other groups, they weren't lost. They just picked them up and, um, Use them too. So we move on to earning a living. Uh, most Mesopotamians at this time drew their livelihood from the land, either directly as farmers and herders, again, bringing animals into one location and keeping them there so they don't run away, or indirectly as carters, wine pressers, millers, or, uh, and that has to do with grains or any of the dozen other occupations that transformed agrarian products into food and drink and deliver them to the consumer. So even though you have barley and wheat, you have to mill them or make the grapes into wine and make them actual food and drink products and the consumer, the people that would buy them. For every person who lived in an urban setting and did not have to grow his or her own food, there were 10 or 20 who lived in the agrarian villages that surrounded the cities and spent most of their labor in the fields or the pasture. As we know from both historical and archaeological evidence of many kinds and from many places, commerce was also primarily concerned with trade in foodstuffs, grain above all. There's that grain again. Might come in one of the questions. Don't say, oh, what's the important? Oh, it was cheese, right? No, there was no cheese at the time. 
that I know of, right? Uh, although other commodities essential to living had to be imported, it is easy for us to forget just how much of the time and energy of early civilizations went into the pursuit or chasing of sufficient caloric intake, which means they wanted to eat more. They were usually always hungry. Now we eat too much and we need to reduce our caloric or calorie intake. Three square meals a day were often the exception. So very rare to have three meals a day. And the ordinary person rarely took them for granted. So let's say if you're used to eating two meals a day or one, and then you got two one day or lucky enough once a month get three, they were one happy group of folks. Not all occupations involve farming or foodstuffs, however, a few required education and a degree of formal training, scribes, people who wrote books, uh, bookkeepers, people who wrote numbers down and accounts in books, and the priesthood, for example. Although each civilization had some learned occupations, they varied in prestige and in the number of persons who practiced them. Mesopotamian city dwellers or people who lived in the city seem to have been literate or able to read to an unusual degree and took writing for granted as a normal part of daily life. Many other occupations or jobs did not require literacy or the ability to read and write, but they did demand a lengthy period of apprenticeship. Most of these occupations were found in towns. They included metalworking, leather work, jewelry making and all types of ceramics. Um, as well as fine and rough carpentry, masonry, building buildings and other building trades. So it's funny the people that lived in a city that didn't have these manual skills, but had other skills. They didn't even realize how lucky they were to be able to read and write. These other folks could make a living and do their leather work or, you know, jewelry making, and they didn't know how to. So again, that, that just goes throughout history for many different levels. People aren't happy or understand they should be appreciative for what they do have when it's, you know, of a high level compared to other folks. They just take it for granted, okay? So um, have to move on here. Where'd the arrow go? There it is. Okay. Besides these skilled jobs, there were shopkeepers, their clerks and errand boys, people who did, hey, go get this, go get that. Those are errands. Casual laborers available for any type of manual work. So these folks kind of show up and say, hey, we need a job today or we need some money. We'll work for you today or maybe today and tomorrow, but they weren't permanent workers. That's why it's a casual. Uh, available for any type of manual task, which means work done by your hands, and a large number of trades connected with the production of clothing and textiles. Many people were also involved in the preparation, distribution, and sale of food. Well, gotta have food. Whether in shops or at eating places such as taverns and street booths, taverns are another term for a bar, but a bar that sells food because some bars do not, they only sell alcohol. Uh, one crucial task, which we in the present day United States rarely think about, was obtaining a regular supply of water. This was one of the most important tasks of women and children, and it took great amounts of time and labor. Yeah, we, so we as modern folks take that for granted. Some civilized centers uh, employed more of one type of labor than others, but overall there was a rough parity. Most jobs were in small scale enterprises. These were usually family owned and staffed with perhaps two or three paid or slave laborers. And this doesn't mean Africans, this means people at the time, you know, 
whoever lived there, the Mesopotamians, the Sumerians, the Palestinians, the Jewish people, they were slaves, some of them, right, to, to earn money to eat. Slavery was less common in some places, but slaves made up a sizable portion of the working population in all ancient societies except early Egypt and China. So wow, all populations. Uh, they sometimes performed much of the particularly unpleasant, which means people that don't like these, there's some bad jobs, or dangerous work, mining and handling the dead, for example. Yeah, I guess no, that's interesting. No regular people want to handle dead bodies, right? So maybe because of this beginning, uh, if you don't know the term, uh, mausoleum or uh, embalmer. An embalmer is a person that, you know, your loved one has died. You're going to want to uh, take it to a funeral home and you want an open casket within the week so that people can see their dead loved one one last time. Uh, you know, so they do the best, the embalmers, to make the body look as presentable and alive as possible. So over time, now this kind of job uh, pays pretty well, right? Because still, most people uh, don't want to do it. Like, I wouldn't want to do it. I worked in the Forest Lawn Cemetery. Uh, doing security. And, uh, I don't know if I told the story before, but one of my big jobs was protecting Michael Jackson's dead body. So I was in the mausoleums and then actually where the embalmers worked and I saw many dead bodies and many in different stages of, you know, like they bring it in and then they have to drain the blood first and then put a solution, a green solution in there called embalming fluid so that the body doesn't, because the body will move and get stiff. So they don't want that to happen. And then they have to wash it and clean it. And then somebody has to shampoo the hair and then do the makeup. So I had to go in there many times and see many dead bodies. So at least I didn't really have to work on them. So, you know, good thing now that that pays pretty good. But here's the beginning of that. Uh, religion and the afterlife. We'll touch a little bit on that. We're more concerned this week about agrarians. Uh, our knowledge of the Sumerians' religion is sketchy and unsure, which means you don't have a complete list of information. It's kind of a little bit here, a little bit there. That's why it's sketchy. And then unsure. We're not sure of the authenticity of what we do have. Uh, as in most ag agrarian civilizations, they believed in a host of nature gods polytheism, Greek for many gods, uh, everywhere all over the world, like in Japan, you had Shintoism, you know, who was a god in the beginning before Buddhism came? The mountain, the river, the stone, you know, most everybody was like that all over the world. And they had various ranks, which means some, uh, some gods were higher than others or had more power, believe it or not. In the Aztec religion, uh, there was actually a god for getting drunk or pulque, yes. Uh, getting drunk and being happy. That, that, that'd be an interesting one to have. This is my God, the God of tequila. And uh, he tells me I have to get drunk a lot. So I'm just following my religion and it's important, right? It's pretty cool. Uh, might not be good for your health though. Uh, there were many male and female deities, which is another word for gods, uh, each with specific competencies or uh, levels of power in natural and human affairs. Among the most important were the Inanna, the goddess of love and fertility. So you pray to her and uh, first you hopefully you find love and then you get married and then later you uh, wanted to have many children. And people say, well, why? You know, because the life was so hard. Let's say if at the time, let's say you did have 10 children, you know, the wife was still alive after 10 children. Because life was so hard, as they grew up, you might have had three of them that died. And then you only had seven. It was that tough. 
And the water god, Enki. Oh, Enkuchen from Mongolia? Is she a water god? I didn't know that. There it is, what I call her, Enki. Uh, these gods were much like superhumans. With all the faults and weaknesses of men and women. Interesting. So not completely like a god that they had. They recognized weaknesses and faults. So kind of like they had powers. They were superhumans, but humans because uh, they acknowledged their weaknesses. Some were immensely or very, very powerful. Their will affected all the Sumerian settlements. And they were believed to rule over all of nature and humanity. Again, if I go back to uh, Aztec gods, they had a god of rain too. So different gods, different levels of power, different levels of importance. Okay. In addition, each city kingdom had its local gods. So I guess it's like, hey, well, LA's got their gods, man, but I got the K-Town gods. And then I know my other friend, he's got the Hollywood gods. So that's how you can look at it. And spirits of the land and sky who were crucial to the prosperity or success of the citizens who had to be carefully placated, which means kind of apple polish the gods. So anyway, this brings us to some questions here. We've gone on a bit, okay? We've gone on a bit here. So I have to bring my question sheet over. Okay, so this would be for 20. Okay, so let's uh, go back to the whiteboard. Get that pencil. Okay, so the first question, which will be question seven. And let me stretch here. Okay. Repeating the early history of Mesopotamia under the Sumerians is a tale of what? First, let me again uh, explain for the funny guys out there. They say, tail, are we talking about an animal? Was it a cow that was mentioned? No, tail is another word for story. Okay. So, what I want here is just tell me during the time of Mesopotamia, when the Sumerians were in charge, tell me some things that happened, some important things that happened. That's what they're saying. It's a story of, and then what's the story about? Oh, one, two, three, whatever these things happened in Mesopotamia. Okay, question eight. All right, let me stretch this one. Uh, most, this is not all, but most, gotta be careful with the 100% uh, statements. Most Mesopotamians drew their livelihood from the land, how? 
All right, again, for those funny guys, they're going to say, was that drawing with a pencil or a pen? No, Drew took, made their livelihood, how they sustained themselves from the land. How? How do they do this? And a hint I'll give you is I think there's two different ways, which each have their own explanations. How? So let me give you a few to answer these. So take a little longer on these two. And again, that's from page 20, Wani. Okay, for page 20. No rush. Are you getting through on those two? I'll give you a couple more seconds, minutes. All right, you should should be enough time for those. You grab the eraser. Again, repeating for your benefit. Uh, the early history of Mesopotamia and the Sumerians is a story or tale of what, tell me some things that happened, good things. Most Mesopotamians drew their livelihood from the land. How, how did they make their living? So seven's gone, eight's gone. Back to the material. Okay, so we ended here placated, apple polished. Here's a nice photo titled Ziggurat, the stepped pyramid or pyramidal form uh, has been used from one end of the earth to the other for religious monuments. It combines an overpowering sense of mass and permanency with a mystical projection of divine godly superiority over earthbound humans. Pyramids like this Mesopotamian ziggurat can also be found in Egypt, South and Central America, and in modified form, Southeast Asia. The Mesopotamian variety was constructed of earthen bricks, which demanded frequent renovation or fixing, lest, which means unless, unless they dissolve into ruins through time's erosive force or an enemy's vandalism. Okay. Now we're going to head to the bottom. Uh, this will be 21, Wani. Uh, professionally trained priests. The gods were thought to reside or live at times in the great temple complexes, crowned and protected by the ziggurats. We just looked at a ziggurat temple or pyramid or stepped pyramids. Here, hundreds of priests and their dependents ritually prayed and made offerings to them on behalf of the city state's welfare. The best known ziggurat erected by the powerful city of Babylon long after the Sumerian epoch was the Tower of Babel of biblical frame. The two features of Mesopotamia's natural environment that stood out the most were the aridity of the climate, which means a very dry, like uh, Las Vegas, and the unpredictability of the river's annual floods on which everyone relied for growing. So. You rely on it for growing, but sometimes uh, they had floods. 
Like nature, which they control, the Mesopotamian gods were frequently cruel toward their human creatures and highly unpredictable. Men and women were the slaves of their god creators, intended as the providers of the labors that the gods didn't wish to perform. Every religious function was performed on behalf of the community. Hence, there is little evidence of a personal loving relationship between deities and humans here. Wow, that's, that's pretty tough, spicy stuff. Uh, nor is there any trace of ethics in Mesopotamian religion. This demands of the gods had no intrinsic connection with doing good or avoiding evil on earth beyond what offerings and ritual acts could win from them to assure the regularity of the natural cycles on which a farm-based economy depended. The gods often punished humans, but not for moral failings like in the Christian religion or uh, Islamic religion or Jewish, or what we would call sin. That wasn't a big thing. Being nature gods, the punishments often took the form of natural catastrophes. There's the catastrophe again such as droughts, no water for a long time, so the plants die, or floods that harmed the entire community, destroyed their homes. To avert or avoid punishment, the gods had to be appeased, which again, that's the apple polishing, with frequent costly rituals and ceremonies, which were the responsibility of a hereditary priesthood, and to a lesser extent, the rulers. The priests used their power as interpreters of the will of the gods to create large and wealthy temple communities supported by the offerings of the citizens. In some Sumerian cities, the priests seem to have been the true rulers for a time. So they were in charge, not a king or a queen, but the priests for a certain amount of time. This practice ended with the conquest by Sargon the Great, again Sargon, who made the royal throne supported by a powerful army, the undisputed center of authority. The religion was certainly not an optimistic one, and it seems to have had no clear ideas on the nature of the afterlife, which means heaven or hell. So you see this picture here, um, Sumerian priest from Uruk, 3,500 to 300 to 3,000 BC, used vases, that's what they're holding, see? Uh, vases uh, like this one to make offerings to the gods. So inside these vases were things that they offered to the gods. The vase depicts water, wheat, or barley growing from the water and naked priests gradually or gratefully presenting the first fruits of a successful crop to Inanna, the goddess of fertility. So on to the question page here for 21. I have a question here. Okay, back to the whiteboard. Pencil. I have two questions here. Nine. And you stretch it. Name two features of Mesopotamia's natural environment that stood out. So two on the natural environment. Question 10, it will be our last one for the day. Back to stretching. Every religious function was performed on the behalf of whom? So that means for whom did they perform the religious function? 
right? All right, so let me give you a minute or two to answer those. I'll make my markings. I'll give you a couple more. Okay, we should be able to wrap that up. So got my eraser. Repeating for your benefit, name two features of Mesopotamia's natural environment that stood out, okay? 10, every religious function was performed on the behalf of whom? Be careful you look at this. I put the correct wording, the exact wording, so you should be able to find it. I don't want you to get tricked here, okay? So I've just got, that's the last question, but I got just a little bit more reading here. Okay, does it want to open? Interesting. It might be shorter than I expect if it won't open. There we go. Okay, so we ended down here. That's it, see? Like I said, tiny bit of reading, but no more questions. All right, so anyone could enjoy immortality. That's good. Anyone can enjoy immortality. If you don't know what that is, that means being able to live forever. The best approach seemed to be honor and obey the gods as well as you could appease them, apple polish, by making offerings to their powerful priests, okay, offerings to the priest, and hope to prosper or have success in this life and the afterlife, if there was one, which wasn't clearly stated. Much of what is known about Mesopotamian religious beliefs derives or comes from their literature, in which several major myths of Western civilization, including the flood in the Garden of Eden, find their first expression. So there you go. We've gone through our second week. Okay. Uh, we've got the 10 questions, which I think is a little bit shorter than last week. So you should be happy about that. So that's end of the agrarian information and uh, hopefully everything's okay with you as you can see i'm in this beautiful beach area if you believe that i don't know what to tell you but um so i will see you next week the week of the third so uh have a good week all right take your time wear your masks uh, we got covid to deal with okay bye-bye